Right, okay. So this is a very fast-paced presentation, and it's based around the work inside the, uh, uh, the book I've written, A Peace in the Age of Chaos. So the book itself, it covers a lot of my personal experiences and the journey to peace. Also, we covers the entrepreneurial journey on creating a uh, international think tank, and then, but more importantly, the underlying theme and work. And what we postulise is that the, if you like, democracy in the West in the current age, as we'll say, has squeaky wheels, and it's in need of revigoration. We think that positive peace is a transformational concept which can reinvigorate Western democracies and that, by that reinvigorate the world. So that's the fast paced presentation. Uh, so I'll move, move through it. And I think I've got half an hour, haven't I, John? Absolutely. But on a more, but on a more somber note, John, you might remember a last year, I was at the conference in person. And uh, just before I got up to give the presentation, I was notified that my mum died. And so jumped on a plane flew back to Australia uh, to attend the funeral, but uh, she was 98, so we, in, all in all, it was a, a pretty good innings. But just, uh, yeah, just reminded me of the event today. Okay. So anyway, into the presentation. So I've got four different themes I'm going to cover. What First, the state of the world today. What is positive peace? Societal systems and some very basic information on how they operate, and then why positive peace is transformation, can I create for transformational change? So without to do, let's get into the state of the world today. So if we go back over the last decade, we find that the, the global peace decreased by about 2.5%, but that doesn't really mean much to anyone. But to put that in context, 81 countries deteriorated in peace, 79 countries improved. So we can see in many ways it's very, very finely balanced, but we can see by the size of the decrease that countries, when they fall in peace, they fall much more quickly than what they do when they rise. So we really do need a lot more countries becoming more peaceful than the ones decreasing to actually have a net improvement in peace. So what the Global Peace Index is divided up into three different domains. So we'll just quickly now have a look at each of those three different domains. So the first one we'll have a look at is safety and security. So over the past decade, that's deteriorated. And it, a lot of it has to do with the sort of the state of terrorism, but still terrorism has now dropped dramatically from its peak. So it's down by about, uh, so yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it's down by about 60% since its peak. But it's still well above a decade ago. So now also if we start to look at the refugees, internally displaced people, they've increased over that period of time. And we'll notice with homicides, homicides have actually improved over that decade as well. But a slide here for the number of police and the number of people incarcerated, they've got a lot worse. So now quickly move into ongoing conflict, that's deteriorated over the last decade as well. And you can see the battlefield deaths after 2010, they have peaked, then fallen back. And that's with the uh, demise of ISIS in the, uh, the wars in Syria and Iraq. But what's telling, what's telling on this is if we look at total conflicts, they've actually gone up during the period while the number of battlefields and deaths have gone down. But also, even though a lot of these conflicts are much lower level, the intensity of those conflicts has increased over time. So this is a bit of a warning bell for the future of what we need to really look at. And I'll come to that, what one of the warning bells are in just a few minutes. Contrary to most people's thoughts, the militarisation domains actually increased over that period of time. That's mainly been around more countries reducing their military expenditure from the size of their armed personnel. While some countries have still increased it quite dramatically like China. So we come back and now we look at the current age we're in at the moment. Probably the post-COVID-19 environment is going to be looking pretty terrible. So for just this is the GDP drops which are estimated for 2020 for a whole group of different countries. So you'll note Spain, Italy, United Kingdom, Belgium and Portugal all are expecting big 
big drops in their GDP. We come down to a couple of the selected ones which are likely to go best, Korea and Australia, but you'll note both of them have much smaller debt. And it's, there's an interplay there between debt and the ability and the effectiveness of economies to be able to recover. And that has something to do with the ability to stimulate them, but it's more about just the effects debt has on an economy. Now, we released an ecological threat register last week. And so that, what we looked for in that was we looked at the countries which are going to have the biggest shocks and the countries which are going to have the lowest resilience. And so there were two baskets we looked at, resource risk, which included water, food and population. In that basket were 740 million people living in countries which face severe shock, very low resilience. India was not one of them because it's got moderate resilience. We look on the other side, we did natural disasters and that created about 1 billion people. So what we had was 43 countries all up. We removed the duplicates, and that there were 32 countries. And in those countries, 1.2 billion uh, a year, a people live, and that they're at risk of being displaced in the next 30 years. Now, what was amazing, or not amazing, shocking about this, is we looked into these countries, and there's a number of different ways of looking at it, They've also, a lot of the most conflicted countries in the world. So what we can see is there's this vicious cycle, if you like, between conflict and resource degradation. And if we look at the number of conflicts, which are increasing, low intensity, but the intensities of increasing, and this is, we think, is one of the nexuses the future conflicts over the next uh, 30 years. Of those, of the 10 countries which are facing the most shocks, that's four or more shocks, Nine, see, 10 of them are actually in, in conflict or very low peace countries at the moment. So four of the five least peaceful countries in the world also amongst this group. So this is the area which is the, there's the resource degradation goes on, is really likely to be the most fragile states where you'll have the future conflicts. This will result in a number of immigration paths. One of them will be out of the Latin America to Europe, the others will be out of Africa and out of South Asia with both of those immigration routes into Europe. We can see how a small number of immigrants or refugees, 2.2 million roughly, in the 2015-2016 crisis changed the political landscape in Europe. We saw political instability increase and we saw new political parties rise out of that. Now, if we look at the countries just with the most threats, this is four threats or greater, uh, 2.1 billion people live in those countries. Just have a quick scan of them. Afghanistan faces the most threats at six. We can see the impact on there. Mozambique, for example. Namibia, which is not so bad, but Botswana's not so bad, but we have Ethiopia down in there. India's facing four. You have Iran, Iraq, Kenya. So you can see they're a lot serious. You can see a lot of these countries, the ones which are likely to be stressed. Now, if you look over the last decade, what we see is that civil unrest has been on the increase. So the back end of COVID-19 and with the economic downturns from that, we expect this to be turbocharged. So we're looking at it. If you look at the demonstrations overall, they've actually increased 240% over the last decade. Riots, 280%. So these, these, are, these, are, these are big figures in a decade. Now, we come back and we start to look at positive peace. We look at Europe. We look just between 2013 and 2017. We'll be updating this data fairly soon. What we can see is that Europe, and many of these measures, has fallen backwards, like the functioning of the government, the distribu equitable distribution of resources, acceptance of the rights of others, perceptions of corruption and free flow of information, which in many ways is epitomised by the you know, you know, free press. So we can see when we look at the economic downturn coming, the history of the last, uh, you know, you know, last few years, that there are issues. Now, if we start to look at the Western democracies and we start to look at the attitudes, we can see that there's a number of the different attitudes, domains of positive peace which are formed. Group grievances, quality of information, the fractionalisation of elites, 
the quality of the political democracies, the freedom of the press, and the equitable distributions of resources. And I think we can all identify with this. So this, this is the nexus of where we can see the breakdown of the of uh, you know, Western society. So now that brings me around to the next part, positive peace. So the way we arrive at positive peace, we take the global peace index, which matches actual peace. We do statistical analysis. We've got something like 25,000 different data sets. We run it against, understand statistically what are the factors most are closely associated with highly peaceful societies. We call that positive peace, and now we turn that round in an index. Now that's really profound because we've now got the ability to see if those qualities how they align with a whole lot of other things we think are important. And it also gives us an ability now to be able to measure the movement of countries as well. And one of the things which comes out of this, you can use it as a measure of resilience, which is what we did in those e e when studying ecological threats. So positive peace it's, it's it consists of eight different uh, structures, well-functioning government, equitable distribution of resources, free flow of information, sound business environment, low levels of corruption, acceptance of the rights of others, high levels of human capital, and good relationships with neighbours. When we do the statistical analysis, not only do these qualities create higher levels of peace, they also create higher per capita income, so they're good for business. Societies are more resilient, less likely to implode and be able to adapt to change. They're better on environmental outcomes, higher, better on higher measures of well-being, and perform better on measurements of the millennium development goals. It's too early to really see for the sustainable development goals. So in many ways, this describes an optimal environment for human potential to flourish. Now, if we start, okay, yeah, we'll just come back to this for a sec, sorry. So we start to look at this, look at 2009 to 2018 within Europe. We start to see what the counters have improved and what ones have deteriorated the most. So business environment in some ways has improved. Uh, internet's up, so in what way the free flow of information is good. Life expectancies up, average per capita incomes up, gender equalities up. But on the negative side, the ones which I mentioned earlier on, quality of information, the equitable distribution of the uh, resources, exclusion by socioeconomic degree, freedom of the press, political democracy, group grievances are all down. And so they're the areas of focus moving forward into the future. The US is even more stark. So we can see the quality of information, the fractionalization of the, of the elites, group grievances and press freedoms. The group grievances and the fractionalization of the elites we can get see getting played out daily in the US politics. So let's come back now and we'll have a quick look at systems and how they operate and just a very touch point on how they how they operate uh, within societies. And I think this is profound and I know a, a number of people lead, such as John's doing a lot of research into this as well. So we start to look at societies and systems, they're very, very different in the way we actually look at societies and try and operate at the moment. We think mainly in cause and effect. There's a problem, what's the cause? Let's try and fix it by changing, change, changing, the, changing the cause. But in many ways, it, leads to unintended outcomes and consequences in many, many, many different ways. Systems operate differently. Rather than the events, it's the relationships and flows. The events come out of the relationships and flows. So if you can change the relationships and flows, then the events don't arise in the first place, which you have to correct. So that's simply in a nutshell. So we think of it, systems lie within systems. So we've got the ecosystem, international community, nations. Then inside the nations, you've got other systems like parliament, parliaments, police, schools. We spend our time working at the level of the nation, state or countries to better understand the way the systems they operate. So if you think about it, and you think about sort of cause and effect, what I want you to think about is three things. Corruption, the press, 
well-functioning government. Does well-functioning government influence the way the press operates through rules and regulations? Does well-functioning government affect corruption and the way it operates? Or does corruption actually change the way government operates and change the way information flows? Or does free flow of information change the government? Or does it change perceptions of corruption and expose where corruption is? We can't separate the causality. It's all too finely intergrained. So that brings us back to looking at the system. This is just a very, very simple example. So some of the properties of systems, they're self-regulating. They seek homeostasis, in other words, a constant state, but they're always adjusting. They're path dependent. What that means is the history, the momentum of history determines its forward progression. And you can't radically change a path. You can only change it, change it over time unless it hits a tipping point and the whole system rebalances. So co concepts of encoded norms, they tend to regulate the system to maintain this homeostasis. Systems are also self-modifying. When there's persistent mis mismatches between the inputs and the outcomes, they'll self-modify to try and now find a new homeostasis. And that, quite often, when it's big, is a tipping point. They also form cycles, so they're self-reinforcing in a particular direction quite often. They can be virtuous or vicious cycles, depending on what's happening with inside the system. And finally, to really understand all this stuff, mathematics is the way to go, rather than it being sort of a moral judgment or something which we uh, operate quantitatively. So if we look at systems, what happens? They consist of encoded norms and intent. So they have inputs, so inputs come into the system. So the input within the bounds of the encoded norm, the answer is yes, doesn't do anything and it matches the intent. If it's not, the system then makes a response. Response aims at going back and changing the input. Think of a terrorist attack and a government's response. Think of the outbreak of COVID-19 and the government's response. Think of high inflation and the government's response. Think of a recession and the government's response. So that's the examples of just a input into a system, not matching the encoded norm and the system's responses. And that's to create the homeostasis. But systems are path dependent. And so you can make many, many small changes. It's the safest way to nudge a system in the system in the direction you want to go. And if you get the nudges right, the system will reinforce and get a virtuous cycle. Get it wrong, you'll end up in a vicious cycle. And so we can all think of the vicious cycles and I won't go through the detail. Now, let's just hit a few tipping points, if we'd like. So, GDP and peace, very strong tipping point there. Corruption and peace. Corruption can increase for quite a while with very little input on the system, or sorry, effect on the system, after which point in time, small increases in corruption and peace radically deteriorates. So the same thing with inflation and peace comes back to economic management. You'll also see inequality and peace, very, very similar sort of relationship there as well. And so they're just a couple of examples of, of tipping points within systems. And if you had a very good look at that, the tipping points are all around the same, same area. So what you can see from that is countries move towards these tipping points at a certain point you don't need much change and you get all these factors changing together. And so that's really, really important to realise. And it's similarly, it works in the other way. It's virtuous or vicious, these cycles. So what we're going to do now is just look at some of the things which positive peace is associated with. So if you get the system going right. So very high peace countries in the last 60 years, on average, have averaged about 2% per annum higher GDP growth rate. You multiply that over 60 years, and that's phenomenal. And that's a business story. So that's back to business. We look at the relationship between the uh, positive peace and well-being. You'll find a correlation of 0.93. So again, if you can get the positive peace working, it'll increase the well-being of the society. 
scores on envir environmental performance. Again, countries with the low positive piece perform worse than countries with high positive piece. So the high positive piece countries, simply because their adaptability and their resilience and also their wealth are much better situated to be able to react on their environment. Prevalence of civil resistance movements. So if you look at civil resistance movements, for example, so if you're looking at high positive peace companies, countries, they have less civil resistance movements. They last for a short amount of time. They're more moderate in their aims. They're more likely to achieve their aims. And they're far, far, far less, less violent. And that comes back to the resilience and adaptability of high positive peace societies. We come back and we start to look at food security and look at that in relationship to positive peace. And this comes back to the resources, which I see uh, you're talking about earlier on. So we start to look at water. Food is a byproduct of water. We look at those countries, those 19 countries, which I had mentioned earlier on, many of them are going to double their population over the next, more than double their population over the next uh, year, year, 30 years. In fact, 17 countries are going to more than double their population between now and 2050. And that's going to put vast strains on the water. So we looked at the available fresh water on the planet, which 60% of it is being used in the last 60 in the last 60 years. And so at this rate, we're going to really run out of water unless we can work out new ways of being able to capture and store water. And food's a byproduct of water. Over the next 30 years, it's estimated the demand for food will increase 50%. That's mainly, fly, that's mainly because the rising economy, economies in Asia and the increasing middle class in uh, China and India. So if we're looking at that then, not only have we got to get the water, we've got to be able to produce the food because those kind of things happen without massive increases in food production. Food prices will go up. The ones which are going to be hit with the most vulnerable, and they'll lie in the countries which I was talking about facing these ecological threats. So if we look at the ESG scores, again, we find this strong correlation with positive peace. We come back and then we look at the distribution of shocks. So countries which are very high in positive peace don't have genocides. Once low in positive peace do. The onset of violent conflict, very high peace countries, there were none in the decade which we studied. We went down and had a look at political shocks, two in the high positive peace countries compared to 70 in low peace countries. So again, this is an example of how positive peace creates resilience. So this brings me back to the point. So we look at it earlier up, the stats which I've shown you, and they're just how can I put it? They're just a very, very small sliver of the problems which we're facing. It could, could have put up the, I don't know, 70 or 80 stats which would have driven this home. So what we see is positive peace is a transformational way of being able to actually start to look at reinvigorating our societies. So that effect, I've written a book. The book also has a whole lot of adventure stories and interesting places I've travelled to, which help, which come out of the family foundation. A lot of it in Africa, a lot of it in war zones, near post war zones, and other uh, developmental aid projects I've done, which started to really formulate my mind around peace. Got it published by Harley Grant, comes out initially in the UK and Australia, but you can buy it off Amazon for any country in the world. Got a whole lot of Prominent people endorsing it, uh, including a, uh, Lord Alderdice. Thank you. Uh, and look, it goes into release on the, uh, the 7th of October, but we're taking pre-orders. If you get pre-orders, then you get a discount on the book. You also get a free copy of the movie we made called The uh, Soldiers of Peace, which won 14 international uh, 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 awards. Uh, and so if you go to the, the Peace in the Age of Economics, feel free to uh, place an order there. Okay, that's the end of my presentation. John, I think I got it right on half an hour, didn't I? But gee, it was fast-paced. <laughs>